Welcome back, everyone, to the By Way of Commandment podcast. I am your host, Jacob Ryder, and I'm excited to have you here today. You guys asked for it, so I'm going to give it to you. We're doing Jesus the Christ by James E. Talmadge. That's right. We're going to be starting a short series in uh, a read-through and review of the book Jesus the Christ by Elder James E. Talmadge that was produced by the church in the early 20th century. Now, um, I want to kind of uh, give some of my own thoughts along the way, but mostly what I want to do is simply read through Jesus the Christ. I'm not going to read through everything in Jesus the Christ. As much as I know there are those of you who uh, would really like me to do a chapter-by-chapter read through of the entire book. I just unfortunately don't think that that would be feasible. It's not feasible for my schedule. And if you'd like to see other videos about other topics besides just me reading Jesus the Christ, um, then it really um, schedule wise would make a lot of sense for me to break this up into multiple videos um, and go through what I think are some of my favorite um, chapters from Jesus the Christ. Um, we're going to cover a lot. Don't worry. I'm not going to only do a couple chapters and then that's it. I am going to cover quite a bit of the book. However, um, what I've been wrestling with in trying to decide how I want to do this is I would like to continue to produce videos about a number of different topics. And I can't do that with my current schedule if uh, I'm trying to get through Jesus the Christ. It will take me a year uh, to get through Jesus the Christ if I, uh, or it will take me at least the next. Um, six months or longer to get through Jesus the Christ if I did one video a week that I've pretty much been doing for the last several uh, months. Um, I'll never get to anything else. So for the rest of the year, it would just be me reading Jesus the Christ. So I I hope that you'll bear with me as um, I make the decision to not cover the entire book. But I do want to cover some really big important Uh, sections of the book. It's all important. I know that I didn't mean it, but um, you know what I mean. And so I want to cover here today, we're going to get into Jesus the Christ, the introduction, and the first few chapters of the book talking about the anti-mortal or pre-mortal godship of Jesus Christ, who God, who Jesus Christ was uh, before his mortal ministry and his place in the grand scheme of the plan of salvation. So, uh, without further ado, let's get into Jesus the Christ by Elder James E. Talmadge, Chapter 1, The Introduction. It is a matter of history that, at or near the beginning of what has since come to be known as the Christian era, the man, Jesus, surnamed the Christ, was born in Bethlehem of Judea. The principal data as to his birth, life, and death are so well attested as to be reasonably indisputable. There are facts of record and are accepted as essentially authentic by the civilized world at large. True, there are diversities of deduction based on alleged discrepancies in the records of the past as to circumstantial details, but such differences are of strictly minor importance. For none of them, nor all taken together, cast a shadow of rational doubt upon the historicity of the earthly existence of the man known in literature as Jesus of Nazareth. As to who and what he was, there are dissensions of grave moment dividing the opinions of men, and this divergence of conception and belief is most pronounced upon those matters to which the greatest importance attaches. The solemn testimonies of millions dead and of millions living Unite in proclaiming him as divine, the son of the living God, the redeemer and savior of the human race, the eternal judge of the souls of men, the chosen and anointed of the father, in short, the Christ. Others there are who deny his godhood while extolling the transcendent qualities of his unparalleled and unapproachable manhood. To the student of history, This man among men stands first, foremost, and alone as a directing personality in the world's progression. Mankind has never produced a leader to rank with him. Regarded solely as a historic personage, he is unique. Judged by the standard of human estimation, 
Jesus of Nazareth is supreme among men by reason of the excellence of his personal character, the simplicity, beauty, and genuine worth of his precepts, and the influence of his example and doctrines in the advancement of the race. To these distinguishing characteristics of surpassing greatness, the devout Christian soul adds an attribute that far exceeds the sum of all the others, the the divinity of Christ's origin and the eternal reality of his status as Lord and God. Christian and unbeliever alike acknowledge his supremacy as a man and respect the epic-making significance of his birth. Christ was born in the meridian of time, and his life on earth marked at once the culmination of the past and the inauguration of an era distinctive in human hope, endeavor, and achievement. His advent determined a new order in the reckoning of the years, and by common consent, the centuries antedating his birth have been counted backward from the pivotal event that are designed accordingly. The rise and fall of dynasties, the birth and dissolution of nations, all of the cycles of history as to war and peace, as to prosperity and adversity, as to health and pestilence, seasons of plenty and famine, the awful happenings of earthquake and storm, the triumphs of invention and discovery, the epics of man's development in godliness, and the long periods of his dwindling and unbelief. All the occurrences that make history are chronicled throughout Christendom by reference to the year before or after the birth of Jesus Christ. His earthly life covered a period of 33 years, and of these, but three were spent by him as an acknowledged teacher, openly engaged in the activities of public ministry. He was bought, or excuse me, he was brought to a violent death before he had attained what we now regard as the age of manhood's prime. As an individual, he was personally known to but a few, and his fame as a world character became generally general only after his death. Brief account of some of his words and works has been preserved to us, and this record, fragmentary and incomplete though it be, is rightly esteemed as the world's greatest treasure. The earliest and most extended history of his mortal existence is embodied within the compilation of scriptures known as the New Testament. Indeed, but little is said of him by secular historians of his time. Few and short, as are the allusions to him made by non-scriptural writers in the period immediately following that of his ministry, enough is found to corroborate the sacred record as to the actuality and period of Christ's earthly existence. No adequate biography of Jesus as boy and man has been or can be written. For the, suffici- for the sufficing reason that a fullness of data is lacking. Nevertheless, man never lived, of whom more has been said and sung, none to whom is devoted a greater proportion of the world's literature. He is extolled by Christian, Mohammedan, and Jew, by skeptic and infidel, by the world's greatest poets, philosophers, statesmen, scientists, and historians. Even the profane sinner in the foul sacrilege of his oath acclaims the divine supremacy of him whose name he desecrates. The purpose of the present treatise is that of considering the life and mission of Jesus as the Christ. In this undertaking, we are to be guided by the light of both ancient and modern scriptures, and thus led, we shall discover, even in the early stages of our course, that the word of God as revealed in latter days is effective in illuming and making plain the holy writ of ancient times, and this in many matters of the profoundest import. Instead of beginning our study with the earthly birth of the holy babe of Bethlehem, we shall consider that the part taken by the firstborn son of God in the primeval councils of heaven, at the time when he was chosen and ordained to be the savior of the unborn race of mortals, the redeemer of a world then in its formative stages of development, We are to study him as the creator of the world, as the word of power through whom the purposes of the eternal father were realized in the preparation of the earth for the abode of his myriad spirit children during the appointed period of their immortal probation. Jesus Christ was and is Jehovah, the God of Adam and of Noah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, 
the God at whose instance the prophets of the ages have spoken, the God of all nations, and he who shall yet reign on earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. His wondrous yet natural birth, his immaculate life in the flesh, and his voluntary death as a consecrated sacrifice for the sins of mankind shall claim our reverent attention, as shall also his redeeming service in the world of disembodied spirits, his literal resurrection from bodily death to immortality, his several appearings to men, and his continued ministry as the resurrected Lord on both continents, the reestablishment of his church through his personal presence and that of the Eternal Father in the latter days, and his coming to his temple in the current dispensation. All these developments in the ministration of the Christ are already of the past. Our proposed course of investigation will lead yet onward into the future concerning which the word of divine revelation is of record. We shall consider the conditions incident to the Lord's return in power and glory to inaugurate the dominion of the kingdom of heaven on earth and to usher in the predicted millennium of peace and righteousness. And yet beyond we shall follow him through the post-millennial conflict between the powers of heaven and the forces of hell and the completion of his victory over Satan, sin, and death, when he shall present the glorified earth and its sanctified hosts, spotless and celestialized unto the Father. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints affirms her possession of divine authority for the use of the sacred name Jesus Christ as the essential part of her distinctive designation. In view of this exalted claim, it is pertinent to inquire as to what special or particular message the Church has to give to the world concerning the Redeemer and Savior of the race, and as to what she has to say in justification of her solemn affirmation, or in vindication of her exclusive name and title. As we proceed with our study, we shall find that among the specific teachings of the Church respecting the Christ are these. 1. The unity and continuity of his mission in all ages, this of necessity involving the verity of his pre-existence and foreordination. 2. The fact of his anti-mortal godship. 3. The actuality of his birth in the flesh as the natural issue of divine and mortal parentage. 4. The reality of his death and physical resurrection as a result of which the power of death shall be eventually overcome. 5. The literalness of the atonement wrought by him, including the absolute requirement of individual compliance with the laws and ordinances of his gospel, as the means by which salvation may be attained. 6. The restoration of his priesthood and the reestablishment of his church in the current age, which is verily the dispensation of the fullness of times. 7. The certainty of his return to earth in the near future, with power and great glory to reign in person and bodily presence as Lord and King. So that was the introduction. We'll go ahead and move on to chapter 2. Pre-existence and foreordination of the Christ. We affirm on the authority of Holy Scripture that the being who is known among men as Jesus of Nazareth, and by all who acknowledge his godhood as Jesus the Christ, existed with the Father prior to birth in the flesh, and that in the pre-existent state he was chosen and ordained to be the one and the only Savior and Redeemer of the human race. Foreordination implies and comprises pre-existence as an essential condition. Therefore, scriptures bearing upon the one are germane to the other, and consequently, in this presentation, no segregation of evidence as applying specifically to the preexistence of Christ or to his foreordination will be attempted. John the Revelator beheld in vision some of the scenes that had been enacted in the spirit world before the beginning of human history. He witnessed strife and contention between loyalty and rebellion, with the hosts defending the former led by Michael the archangel and the rebellious forces captained by Satan, who is also called the devil, the serpent, and the dragon, 
We read, quote, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. In this struggle between unembodied hosts, the forces were unequally divided. Satan drew to his standard only a third part of the children of God, who are symbolized as the, quote, stars of heaven. The majority either fought with Michael or at least refrained from active opposition, thus accomplishing the purpose of their first estate. While the angels who arrayed themselves on the side of Satan kept not their first estate and therefore rendered themselves ineligible for the glorious possibilities of an advanced condition or second estate. The victory was with Michael and his angels, and Satan, or Lucifer, theretofore a son of the morning, was cast out of heaven. Yea, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The prophet Isaiah, to whom these momentous occurrences had been revealed about eight centuries prior to the time of John's writings, laments with inspired pathos the fall of so great a one, and, he, and specifies selfish ambition as the occasion. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit." Justification for citing these scriptures in connection with our present consideration will be found in the cause of the great contention, the conditions that led to this war in heaven. It is plain from the words of Isaiah that Lucifer, already of exalted rank, sought to aggrandize himself without regard to the rights and agency of others. The matter is set forth in words that none may misapprehend, in a revelation given to Moses and repeated through the first prophet of the present dispensation. Quote, and I, the Lord God, spake unto Moses, saying, That Satan, whom thou hast commanded in the name of mine only begotten, is the same which was from the beginning. And he came before me, saying, Behold, here am I, send me, I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind, that, not, that one soul shall not be lost. And surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me thine honor." But behold, my beloved son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me, and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power, by the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down, and he became Satan, yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men, and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. Thus it is shown that prior to the placing of man upon the earth, how long before we do not know, Christ and Satan, together with the hosts of the spirit children of God, existed as intelligent individuals, possessing power and opportunity to choose the course they would pursue and the leaders whom they would follow and obey. In that great concourse of spirit intelligences, the Father's plan, whereby his children would be advanced to their second estate, was submitted and doubtless discussed. The opportunity, so placed within the reach of the spirits who were to be privileged to take bodies upon the earth, was so transcendentally glorious that those heavenly multitudes burst forth into song and shouted for joy. Satan's plan of compulsion, whereby all would be safely conducted through the career of mortality, bereft of freedom to act and agency to choose, so circumscribed that they would be compelled to do right, that one soul would not be lost, was rejected. And the humble offer of Jesus as the firstborn to, uh, to assume mortality and live among men as their exemplar and teacher observing the sanctity of man's agency, but teaching men to use aright that divine heritage, was accepted. The decision brought war, which resulted in the vanquishment of Satan and his angels, who were cast out and deprived of the boundless privileges incident to the mortal or second estate. 
In that August council of the angels and the gods, the being who later was born in flesh as Mary's son, Jesus, took prominent part, and there was he ordained of the Father to be the Savior of mankind. As to time, the term being used in the sense of all duration past, this is our earliest record of the firstborn among the sons of God. To us who read, it marks the beginning of the written history of Jesus the Christ. Old Testament scriptures, while abounding in promises relating to the actuality of Christ's advent in the flesh, are less specific in information concerning his anti-mortal existence. By the children of Israel, while living under the law and still unprepared to receive the gospel, the Messiah was looked for as one to be born in the lineage of Abraham and David, empowered to deliver them from personal and national burdens, and to vanquish their enemies. The actuality of the Messiah's status as the chosen Son of God, who was the Father from the beginning, a being of pre-existent power and glory, was but dimly perceived, if conceived at all, by the people in general, and although to prophets especially commissioned in the authorities and privileges of the holy priesthood, revelation of the great truth was given. They transmitted it to the people rather in the language of imagery and parable than in words of direct plainness. Nevertheless, the testimony of the evangelists and the apostles, the attestation of the Christ himself while in the flesh, and the revelations given in the present dispensation leave us without dearth of scriptural proof. In the opening lines of the gospel book written by John the Apostle, we read, quote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This, sim- this passage is simple, precise, and unambiguous. We may reasonably give to the phrase, in the beginning, the same meaning as attaches thereto in the first line of Genesis. And such signification must indicate a time antecedent to the earliest stages of human existence upon the earth that the word is Jesus Christ, who was with the Father in, the, in that beginning, and who was himself invested with the powers and rank of Godship, and that he came into the world and dwelt among men, are definitely affirmed. These statements are corroborated through a revelation given to Moses, in which he was permitted to see many of the creations of God and to hear the voice of the Father with respect to the things that had been made. Quote, And by the word of my power have I created them, which is mine only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth. Um, I just want to break here for a moment from reading Jesus the Christ um, and just point you to a couple videos I did recently, um, specifically the lectures on faith, lecture number three and four, and a handful of other videos, specifically bearers of the divine name, Uh, in which I talk a little bit more about um, this idea of Christ, um, of Jesus Christ being with the Father and being being a deity, being God in a pre-existent, or rather a pre-mortal existence uh, sense, such as we see in John's Gospel, where in the beginning was the Word, I go into a little bit of detail over this in my video, Bearers of the Divine Name. If you haven't watched that already, um, after this video, you can go ahead and click on that and uh, listen to um, what I have to say about that. But essentially, what is being said here is uh, in Latter-day Saint view, which I believe is more congruent... In the Latter-day Saint view, which I believe is uh, more in line with the Hebrew and Greek of the Old and New Testament, Christ is differentiated with the Father, but is deity. He is divine. And so, um, while he was with the Father in the beginning, or rather before the worlds were created, um, it is through Jesus Christ that God the Father organized his worlds and populated them. 
Um, and so Jesus Christ is essentially the uh, creator of our universe, of our world, and all things in them, uh, as he created under the direction of the Father, is what is being said here by Talmadge, and what is the official Latter-day Saint position, and I believe is most in line with the original Greek of John 1.1. 1, 1. Now this brings us into something that we'll talk about much more in depth in another video, but where John's gospel has Jesus assuming his godhood in the pre-mortal realm, um, we have other of, of the gospels in the New Testament, particularly Mark, assuming uh, Jesus's godship or assuming his um, divinity at his baptism during his mortal life. And so there are some competing views in the Gospels into exactly when and in what manner Christ assumed a divine role. And so John has both um, this idea of Jesus being with God from the beginning, and therefore being uh, a member of the Godhead and being a God himself in the beginning, um, while also affirming that during his mortal life, Jesus received the divine name of the Father as a, uh, as a bearer of that divine name, similar to the way that Christ ordained the apostles to be bearers of his divine name to do his work. And where Jesus says multiple times throughout the Gospel of John that he was sent from the Father to do the Father's will, he sends out the apostles to do his will in the name of Christ and the Father. And so we have this um, not necessarily competing views in John's Gospel, um, but somewhat different views into how exactly Jesus is divine, in what manner and in what magnitude, and how that divinity or that divine um, uh, let's say that divine ministration um, carries on through Christ from the Father and through to the apostles from Christ. Um, whereas Mark's gospel, and by extension, the other synoptic gospels, Luke and um, Matthew, uh, kind of have uh, Jesus assuming his divinity either at his conception and birth with the nativity story or at his baptism. Um, nothing is stated in Mark as, as close as um, John's gospel and having anything to do with Jesus being divine um, before his earth life, though it's implied in some scriptures, it's not outright stated the way that John's is. And Matthew and Luke predominantly place a lot of emphasis on the uh, conception and birth of Jesus as being the announcement of his divinity. So we have some competing views here in the Gospels as to exactly when Jesus assumed divinity. Uh, was it before his mortal life? Was it at his birth or conception? Or was it at his baptism? Um, because remember, uh, the Synoptic Gospels specifically, and particularly Matthew um, and Mark are writing to uh, Jews from a Jewish perspective, um, Matthew more so than the others, and the Jews did not believe that the Messiah would necessarily be divine in and of himself. He would not be considered God. He would be a man, but who would be anointed by God for a very special role. And so uh, that idea carried on into the writing of the New Testament, particularly with the Synoptic Gospels, as Jesus being uh, the bearer of the divine name of God in the flesh, but still not entirely clear as to exactly when Jesus assumed the role of divinity, where uh, they, they place it sometime in his lifetime, with the ambiguity of there being a possibility of maybe he was already divine before this life, but never actually explicitly stated, whereas John's gospel explicitly states outright in John 1.1 1, 1, that Jesus was divine uh, in the uh, pre-mortal existence uh, before the worlds were created. And so there are some differences in how, at least, the writers of the gospels uh, wrote about the divinity of Christ, or what we would call 
Christology. So I'm going to get uh, stop there, and I'm going to get back into uh, Talmadge's writings here. It says, Even more impressive and yet more truly conclusive are the personal testimonies of the Savior as to his own pre-existent life and mission among men to which he had been appointed. No one who accepts Jesus as the Messiah can consistently reject these evidences of his eternal nature. When, on a certain occasion, the Jews in the synagogue disputed among themselves and murmured because of their failure to understand aright his doctrine concerning himself, especially as touching his relationship with the Father, Jesus said unto them, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, and then continuing the lesson based upon the contrast between the manna with which their fathers had been fed in the wilderness and the bread of life which he had to offer, he added, I am the living bread which came down from heaven, and again declared, The living Father has sent me. Not a few of the disciples failed to comprehend his teachings, and their complaints drew from him these words. Doth this offend you? What if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? To certain wicked Jews, wrapped in the mantle of racial pride, boastful of their descent through the lineage of Abraham, and seeking to excuse their sins through an unwarranted use of the great patriarch's name, our Lord thus proclaimed his own preeminence. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. The fuller significance of this remark will be treated later. Suffice it in the present connection to consider this scripture as a plain avowal of our Lord's seniority and supremacy over Abraham. But as Abraham's birth had preceded that of Christ by more than 19 centuries, such seniority must have reference to a state of existence antedating that of mortality. When the hour of his betrayal was near in the last interview with the apostles prior to his agonizing experience in Gethsemane, Jesus comforted them, saying, For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came from the Father, and the Father came, and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Furthermore, in the course of upwelling prayer for those who had been true to their testimony of his Messiahship, he addressed the Father with this solemn invocation. Quote, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which with, with which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Book of Mormon scriptures are likewise explicit in proof of the preexistence of the Christ and of his foreappointed mission. One only of the many evidences therein found will be cited here. An ancient prophet, designated as in the record as the brother of Jared, once pleaded with the Lord in special supplication. And the Lord said unto him, Believest thou the words which I shall speak? And he answered, Yea, Lord, I know that thou speakest the truth, for thou art a God of truth and canst not lie. And when he had said these words, behold, the Lord showed himself unto him and said, because thou knowest these things, ye are redeemed from the fall. Therefore ye are brought back into my presence. Therefore I shew myself unto you. Behold, I am he who is prepared from the foundation of the world to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. In me shall all mankind have light, and that eternally, even they who shall believe on my name. And they shall become my sons and my daughters." And never have I shewed myself unto man whom I have created, for never has man believed in me as thou hast. Seest thou that ye are created after my own image? Yea, even all men were created in the beginning after mine own image. Behold this body which ye now behold, is the body of my spirit. And man have I created after the body of my spirit. And even as I appear unto thee to be in the spirit, will I appear unto my people in the flesh. The main facts attested by this scripture as having a direct bearing upon our present subject are those of the Christ manifesting himself 
while yet in his anti-mortal state, and of his declaration that he had been chosen from the foundation of the world as the Redeemer. Revelation given through the prophets of God in the present dispensation is replete with evidence of Christ's appointment and ordination in the primeval world, and the whole tenor of the scriptures contained in the Doctrine and Covenants may be called in witness. The following instances are particularly in point. In a communication to Joseph Smith, the prophet, in May 1833, the Lord declared himself as the one who had previously come into the world from the Father, and of whom John had bore testimony as the Word. And the solemn truth is reiterated that he, Jesus Christ, was in the beginning before the world was, and further, that he was the Redeemer who came into the world because the world was made by him, and in him was the life of men and the light of men. Again, he is referred to as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, even the Spirit of truth which came and dwelt in the flesh. In the course of the same revelation, the Lord said, And now verily I say unto you, I was in the beginning with the Father, and am the firstborn. On an earlier occasion, as the modern prophet testifies, he and an associate in the priesthood, and he and an associate in the priesthood were enlightened by the Spirit, so that they were able to see and understand the things of God. Quote, Even those things which were from the beginning before the world was, which were ordained of the Father through his only begotten Son, who was in the bosom of the Father even from the beginning, of whom we bear record. And the record which we bear is the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the Son, whom we saw and with whom we conversed in the heavenly vision. The testimony of Scripture is written on both hemispheres, that of records both ancient and modern, the inspired utterances of prophets and apostles, and the words of the Lord himself are of one voice in proclaiming the pre-existence of the Christ and his ordination as the chosen Savior and Redeemer of mankind, in the beginning, yea, even before the foundation of the world. All right. So I am going to, I think... Um, I'll, I'll read through the notes here for chapter two, but I don't believe that I'll read the notes to every chapter that we cover, uh, as we read through Jesus the Christ. Um, but I do want to read through a couple of these ones for chapter two, because I do think that they are so important to us for helping us understand our own Latter-day Saint theology. So I'm going to go ahead and do that, but I don't, I don't see myself reading through the notes, through all of the notes of every chapter that we cover. Um, But I should have it, uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning that if you would like to follow along with us and you do not have a physical copy of Jesus the Christ and you are listening to this rather than watching the screen and reading along here, you can simply go to churchofjesuschrist.org or use the Gospel Library app on your phone and Jesus the Christ will be in the Jesus Christ tab. Or if you're on a desktop and you go to churchofjesuschrist.org, you can just simply look up uh, uh, in the library of resources, Jesus the Christ by Elder James E. Talmadge. And you can read the book for free on desktop or on mobile device, um, as well as listen to it. Um, one of the reasons I'm not going to read through every chapter of this is because you can also listen to it in the app, um, just like you do all the rest of the scriptures you can listen to on the app. So that being said, um, I'm going to do my best to cover some of the chapters here in, um, Jesus the Christ that I think are not necessarily most important, but, um, some of my favorite chapters and ones that I think are most helpful in, in understanding what it is we truly believe about Christ and his divinity and his humanity, or what we would call Christology, as well as some um, chapters on the history of Jesus and the apostles and some of the things that um, I think are going to be worthwhile to our studies this year in the New Testament in Come, Follow Me. So um, I will read... 
Notes to chapter two, starting with one, graded intelligences in the anti-mortal state. That the spirits of men existed as individual intelligences of varying degrees of ability and power prior to the inauguration of the mortal state upon this earth, and even prior to the creation of the world as a suitable abode for human beings, is shown in great plainness through a divine revelation to Abraham. Now the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among all these, there were many of the noble and great ones. And God saw these souls that they were good. And he stood in the midst of them and said, These I will make my rulers. For he stood among those that were spirits, and he saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou wast chosen before thou wast born. That both Christ and Satan were among these exal those exalted intelligences, and that Christ was chosen while Satan was rejected as the future Savior of mankind, are shown by the portions of the Revelation immediately following that above quoted. Quote, and there stood one among them that was like unto God, and he said unto those who were with him, We will go down, for there is space there, and we will take of these materials, and we will make an earth whereon these may dwell. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. And they who keep their first estate shall be added upon, and they who keep not their first estate shall not have glory in the same kingdom with those who keep their first estate. And they who keep their second estate shall have glory added upon their heads forever and ever. And the Lord said, Whom shall I send? And one answered like unto the Son of Man, Here am I, send me. And another answered and said, Here am I, send me. And the Lord said, I will send the first. And the second was angry and kept not his first estate, and at that day many followed after him. Notes number two, the primeval council in the heavens. It is definitely stated in the book of Genesis that God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And again, after Adam had taken of the forbidden fruit, the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. And the inference is direct that in all that related to the work of the creation of the world, there was a consultation. And though God spake as it is recorded in the Bible, yet it is evident he counseled with others. The scriptures tell us that there are, quote, God's many and Lord's many. But to us, there is but one God, the Father. And for this reason, though there were other is, others engaged in the creation of the worlds, it is given to us in the Bible in the shape that it is. For the fullness of these truths is only revealed to highly favored persons for certain reasons known to God, as we are told in the scriptures. Quote, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Psalms 25:14. It is consistent to believe that at this council in the heavens, the plan that should be adopted in relation to the sons of God who were, in, who were then spirits and had not yet obtained tabernacles was duly considered. For in view of the creation of the world and the placing of men upon it, whereby it would be possible for them to obtain tabernacles and in those tabernacles obey laws of life and with them again be exalted among the gods, we are told that at that time, Quote, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The question then arose, how and upon what principle should the salvation, exaltation, and eternal glory of God's sons be brought about? It is evident that at the council, certain plans had been proposed and discussed, and that after a full discussion of those principles, and the declaration of the Father's will pertaining to his design, Lucifer came before the Father with a plan of his own, saying, Behold, here am I, send me. I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost. And surely I will do it, wherefore give me thine honor. But Jesus, on hearing this statement made by Lucifer, said, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. From these remarks made by the well-beloved Son, we should naturally infer that in the discussion of the subject, the Father had made, made known his will and developed his plan and design pertaining to these matters, and all that his well-beloved Son wanted to do was carry out the will of his Father, as it would appear had been before expressed. 
He also wished the glory to be given to his father, who, as God the Father, and the originator and designer of the plan, had a right to all the honor and glory. But Lucifer wanted to introduce a plan contrary to the will of his father, and then wanted his honor, and said, I will save every soul of man, wherefore give me thine honor. He wanted to go contrary to the will of his father, and presumptuously sought to deprive man of his free agency, thus making himself thus making him a serf and placing him in a position in which it was impossible for him to obtain that exaltation which God designed should be man's, through obedience to the law which he had suggested. And again, Lucifer wanted the honor and power of his father to enable him to carry out the principles which were contrary to the father's wish. That's an entire quote by John Taylor from Meditation or from Mediation and Atonement. Um, notes number three, the Jaredites. Of the two nations whose histories con- constitute the Book of Mormon, the first in order of time consisted of the people of Jared, who followed their leader from the Tower of Babel at the time of the confusion of tongues. Their history was written on 24 plates of gold by Ether, the last of their prophets, who, foreseeing the destruction of his people because of their wickedness, hid away the historic, historical plates. They were afterward found, B.C. 123, by an expedition sent out by King Limhi, a Nephite ruler. The record engraved on these plates was subsequently abridged by Moroni, and the condensed account was attached by him to the Book of Mormon record. It appears in the modern translation under the name of the Book of Ether. The first and chief prophet of the Jaredites is not mentioned by name in the record as we have it. He is known only as the brother of Jared. Of the people, we learn that amid the confusion of Babel, Jared and his brother importuned the Lord that he would spare them and their associates from the impending disruption. Their prayer was heard, and the Lord led them with a considerable company who, like themselves, were free from the taint of idolatry, away from their homes, promising to conduct them to a land choice above all other lands. Their course of travel is not given with the exactness. We learn only that they reached the ocean and there constructed eight vessels called barges in which they set out upon the waters. These vessels were small and dark within, but the Lord made luminous certain stones which gave light to the imprisoned voyagers. After a passage of 344 days, the colony landed on the western shore of North America probably at a place southern, a place south of the Gulf of California and north of the Isthmus of Panama. Here they became a flourishing nation, but giving way in time to internal dissensions, they divided into fractions which warred with one another until the people were totally destroyed. This, co- this destruction, which occurred near the hill Rama, afterward known among the Nephites as Camorra, probably took place at about the time of Lehi's landing in South America, 590 B.C. And that is from uh, James E. Talmadge's book, Articles on Faith. All right, so that is chapters 1 and 2 of Jesus the Christ by Elder James E. Talmadge, focusing predominantly in these chapters on the preexistence and foreordination of Christ before uh, the creation of the earth. Um. I'm, I'm really enjoying rereading through Jesus the Christ. I hope that uh, you're as excited as I am to kind of go on this journey reading this together. Um, if you have any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to make known, don't be afraid to comment down below in the comment section of the video or email me at bywayofcommandment uh, at gmail.com. That's bywayofcommandment at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you guys and see what other books and things you'd like me to review or read along with you um, at, that pertain to uh, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and um, with that said, I will see you in the next video.